Welcome, everybody. Time to grab your board, catch a wave, and swim out into the sales pipeline with our surf instructor today, uh, Matt Hines. How you doing, Paul? I'm good. I'm good. You have uh, you have company. You're Mr. Rogers' neighborhood today. I know it is. It, it, this is a very special episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. I'm really, really excited about this one. Hey, it is the end of August. As we record this, it's the last day of August. Uh, if you are a sales professional, please listen to this podcast tomorrow. If you're listening to us live, I love it. Thank you very much. But go close some deals, get some deals across the line for the month, and we'll be here for you tomorrow. Uh, thank you, for everyone, for joining us on Sales Pipeline Radio today. Uh, we are here live on the Lead Management Radio Network every Thursday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific. And if you're listening to us from the podcast, appreciate you subscribing and appreciate you listening in. You can find us on iTunes and the the, uh, Google Play Store. And uh, every week we are featuring some of the best and brightest minds in B2B sales and marketing, sharing some best practices, insights on what's working in today's market. And I am very excited, Paul. Today, usually we have a call-in guest from, you know, somewhere around the world. Today, my guest is literally two feet away from me. We're going to talk personas today and the power of personas and the importance of personas. And with me, literally in the Heinz Marketing Studio, you have no. This is this is a world class. It's big. It's big. I've been there. It's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, oh. um, it's got it's got microphones and everything. And so in the in the studio with me today, I have Josh Baez, who is uh, on our marketing team and is working at. There you go. Woo! Yeah, that's, from the live studio audience, um, <laughs> we've got uh, absolutely so excited to have you here, Josh. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on your program. Program. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And we threatened Paul to, to spend this entire half hour just discussing Game of Thrones. Like usually on Monday morning, I come into the office. Maybe I've watched, maybe have a Josh has abs- Josh has watched. I've five, absolutely watched it. He's watched it like five times by Monday morning. <laughs> and so now that we are sitting here, we're through season seven. I think we probably should not give up any spoilers probably. just in case. No, the listeners should. Um, should not mention the fact that Han Solo dies at the end of the season finale. <laughs> Look, man, that's at least a year ago. So yeah. If anyone's it, not seen it yet, then that's. There is there is a statute of limitations on spoilers. <laughs> if it's taken you that long to see uh, Star Wars Episode Seven, I'm sorry, uh, but Harrison Ford didn't want to do Star Wars anymore, so he's out. Harrison Ford died. Yeah, he died. No, no, I, I never saw that. I haven't seen it yet. Oh my goodness! Uh, well, now you've ruined my whole day. I'm sorry. Clearly, this is going to be the strangest episode of Sales Pipeline Radio ever. But I definitely want to talk about personas, and I'm excited to have Josh with us today. He and his team, you know, are doing demand gen programs and building pipeline for a lot of companies in various industries around B two B. But has spent a lot of time in that building personas and centering a lot of efforts around personas. So, I mean, Josh, talk a little bit about why personas are so important and what the approach is you guys typically take to that. Yeah, uh, I think that the important thing to remember about personas is that it kind of helps you develop an empathetic view of who you're selling to. And I think that that's the most important part, just not only with marketing, but just being a person in general. You know, you need to have empathy if you want to really engage the world in any kind of meaningful way. And I think that when you start to develop personas, you're able to kind of put your shoes into buyer's shoes. And and by doing that, you're able to kind of see the world from their point of view. You know, what are their pains? What are they dealing with? What are their goals here? And, and what does your solution do to kind of help that? So we're talking about personas and how important these are. And I think a lot of people just, you know, they know what they want to sell. They know what their product does. And they don't think about that through the eyes of their target audience. Talk a little bit about how those personas need to start Start with what's needed, start with the prospect's perspective, and how one persona isn't necessarily enough in a complex B2B you know, selling opportunity. To address your first point, I mean, when it's when it comes to creating personas, I think that the best thing you can probably do is, you know, interview the people that you're selling to now. And that's something that we try to do whenever we're helping clients develop personas is we interview the customers. We ask them, you know, what are you using the platform for? And how is this impacting your business? What were you doing before before this even happened? And what kind of pains were you suffering um, before them? You're able to kind of get insight from them in that way. The importance of having multiple personas is you're able to identify the multiple people that are in today's new buying committee. Uh, we did a recent report with Snap App, um, one of our partners, and we were able to identify that, like, you know, today's buying committee is made up of all kinds of people, all kinds of different generations. You know, it's now made up of, you know, millennials, Gen X, baby boomers. But within all of those cohorts, you get even more, even more insight into the different levels of people as you get 
into their roles. You reference uh, sort of millennials, and I think it's a, it's it's one of many examples of the kind of criteria you want to be aware of as you're developing personas. Uh, you know, Josh and team just finished some pretty groundbreaking research on generational impact on buying journey, and it looks at some pretty stark differences with millennials and how they engage and where they engage and what channels they follow. We just finished that. We're publishing it shortly with uh, Snap App. And so if you're interested, if you're listening and interested, uh, you know, definitely send us a note on Twitter or through email, and uh, we'll be happy to get you a copy of that as well. But I think it speaks to the complexity of what those personas need to have in them and why they're so important to engage. You know, a lot of people think of personas as something that, that impacts content, and that certainly is true. But talk about why personas are important to have for your sales strategy and for the sales team as well. Right. Well, you know, the worst thing that can happen is when marketing sends leads to sales uh, that aren't ready to close or that sales, you know, they don't really know how best to follow up with a lead because they don't know what marketing has touched them with before. So I think that by sharing these persona details with the rest of your teams, you're able to get more visibility from them. You're able to align your efforts. You're able to communicate with them in consistent ways that really speaks to the complexity of the problems that they're facing. Talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Josh Baez, who is part of the Heinz marketing team and is a veteran of personas across multiple industries and multiple products. Not only with the work that we've seen that have comes to us from new clients, but in the industry, you've seen a variety of different types of personas. You've seen good personas. You've seen bad personas. What are things that separate the good from the bad? And I, th- I think, you know, in, in terms of operational personas as well, it's one thing to have depth of detail. It's another thing to make it something that is a living, breathing document and something that people can actually use. Talk a little bit about that. So I think that the difference between a good persona and a bad persona really comes down to what story does it tell? I've seen a lot of personas that companies will build out with information, you know, about their home life, about their family life, about their kids, about what interests them, their activities that they do after work. And I think that that information is good to kind of ground it. But at the same time, that's not information that any team can really utilize to better sell the product that they're selling unless it directly relates to it. So I think that, you know, making sure that the information that you have with the personas is information that's usable, but also helps to kind of develop a little bit more empathy with with the person. I think empathy is critical, right? I mean, empathy is a big part of this. And I think before you're able to sell what you want to sell, before you're able to sort of get someone interested in your product, you have to get them interested in the problem. You have to get someone interested in solving a problem they may or may not know that exists. And that's a big part of personas. I think another challenge people have when it comes to personas uh, um, is that uh, it's intimidating, right? I think you know people think, well, I know I know my customer, you know, I have enough institutional knowledge uh, to be able to get this right. I don't really want to spend that much time doing this. How do you get started with personas if people aren't used to doing personas today or aren't used to spending the time and effort to make this happen? Uh, what are some ways to get started? Yeah, so like I said before, um, interviewing your customers is crucial. Uh, it's really important to get that customer feedback on how they're using it and what kinds of needs and issues they're having with, you know, you're able to learn to learn essentially what their goals are with the product. And then uh, you also get insight from your sales team uh, since they're really the ones who are interfacing one-on-one directly with the people that they're selling to. I think that they'll have a lot of information to give, you know, what's worked for them in the past, what's something that, that they've noticed that marketing maybe hasn't been able to pick up on because, there's kind of a wall between marketing and the and the lead with email and things that aren't essentially one-on-one sales calls. So I think that the sales team also plays a critical role in persona development. I'm glad you brought that up. Because I mean, let's talk a little about input to personas. I think a lot of companies have a lot of institutional knowledge around the persona a lot, around their customers and who should be part of that. How do you, how else can you sort of leverage sort of those customer facing teams, whether it's sales, customer service, account management? How do you best leverage them to input? And then once you've developed that persona, I imagine that it's best to make it sort of a dynamic thing moving forward. You know, your personas change, the buying behavior changes. What are the best ways to leverage some of those account? those customer facing teams to gather the, that information and incorporate that into personas is there a, is there a cadence that makes sense is there a collection uh, process uh, that you've seen work particularly well uh, especially for organizations that maybe don't have a ton of resources and you know need to do this you know kind of efficiently yeah and i think that you know you of course you can have sort of a cadence set up where you kind of schedule meetings with with different people and with different customers and with different the different people that you're trying to sell to. But at the same time, I think that a lot of people these days, they're so afraid of not looking professional that it actually hinders them from just doing the simple thing, which is just 
reaching out and asking. So I think that a lot of the times we're so concerned with keeping up this business persona, no pun intended, just making sure that like, oh, I want to make sure that I look really smart in front of this person. I want to make sure that I don't look like an idiot by asking these really obvious questions. But at the same time, you know, these are questions that you have. And if you have them, there are probably other people that also have them. So I don't think that asking questions is is a big issue here. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the questions you ask. I think, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, you don't always want to ask a customer an obvious question that you should know the answer to. Mm-hmm. But you also don't want to assume you know the answer to the question either. <laughs> right. And so where do you strike that balance? And I guess, you know, this is this is related to the way that, you know, your your inside sales prospects might engage with people. You know, you create some content, you create an asset or offer for a particular persona. Uh, that lead goes to a sales team, you know, how do you use those personas now to create qualifying questions that the sales organization can ask that gather new information that helps them to sell and helps them to qualify, but also makes best use of the prospect's time? You know, obviously you want to make sure that the prospect is respected in this and that you're not wasting their time when you, when you, when you make these personas. I think that ultimately it, it all comes down to, you know, how can you, how can you make this better for the prospect? Because I think that, you know, it's it all comes down to them. And if you can really put your shoes, put yourself in their shoes, you're able to not only sell more effectively, but you're able to make the message more impactful. You're able to make your content more meaningful. You're able to tell a broader story that is more relevant for them. You have fun on Sales Pipeline Radio? I love it, man. It's great. This is great. I'm so excited to have Josh on Sales Pipeline Radio. As you know, Paul, I just wing this pretty much every week. I mean, Josh <laughs> is sitting here. Josh has extensive notes. He's prepared. He, I think he spent the last, you know, last, you know, 48 hours crying. He's cramming for finals. Last two years. It's, and it shows. It last two years. He knew two years ago <laughs> he was going to be on Sales Pipeline Radio today. It was his dream. It was his dream. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is bucket list stuff here, Paul. Speaking of bucket lists, we're going to have to take a quick break, pay some bills. Uh, we'll be back uh, with more Persona Doc with Josh. Josh Baez from Heinz Marketing. This is Matt Heinz. You're listening to Sales Pipeline Radio. Struggling to align your sales and marketing teams? Maybe you're attempting to implement an ABM strategy in your organization, or your content is underperforming. Whatever the challenge, Heinz Marketing has some great on-demand workshops to help. All of them are fully online and on-demand, so you can access the content whenever you want. You will also receive an interactive workbook, the presentation slides, and templates, all for $195. Visit www.heinzmarketing.com slash workshops. That's H-E-I-N-Z marketing.com and get started now. In a world where the speed of innovation and change in B2B marketing has never been greater, the only thing bigger is the need for clarity or a blueprint for a guide to what's really working and how to apply it specifically to increase sales pipeline growth, velocity, and conversion. That's what you'll find in the Modern Marketer's Field Guide. Download it free at HeinzMarketing.com. All right, back to uh, Matt Heinz neighborhood here. Thank you, Paul. Hey, uh... It is the last day of August, but we have a ton of great content planned for you in September. Next week, we are going to be doing this show live from beautiful Cleveland, Ohio at the Content Marketing World event. Our guest next week is going to be Daniel McGinn. He is the author of Psyched Up, How the Science of Mental Preparation Can Help You Succeed. The following week, we've got Anthony Ian Arena, one of the most interesting and most provocative voices in sales strategy today. His new book is The Lost Art of Closing. We're going to talk about what it means to get deals across the line and what sales and marketing can do together on this. And you know, speaking of content and getting deals across the line, I think you know we've had a number of clients this week, Josh. We're talking to Josh Baez, who's on our marketing team here at Heinz Marketing. Excited to have him on the radio program. A lot of clients this week are, you know, marketing clients are thinking, what do I do to help sales get across the line? What do I do to help a sales team when it's really sort of in the final strokes? And a lot of what we come up with is it's really sort of bespoke, custom, precise content. How can you use those personas? How can you use go back to some of those insights at the beginning of the buying journey to really help get deals closed? Uh, you know, in the final stages. You know, we've been talking a lot about empathy and about persona building and how empathy plays a crucial role in that. And, you know, when it comes to bringing deals across the line, you know, I think that what marketing can really do is communicate not only with the people that they're working with, but also work to ensure that 
what they're communicating to a prospect is actually relevant. We'd say you're creating a white paper for someone and it's all about, you know, their needs based on research that you've done. You know, that all can be great. But if the angle of that white paper doesn't align with the ultimate goals of your prospect, say for whatever reason, be it generational differences, goals in mind for what they're focused on now, then I think that no matter what you're producing, people aren't going to read it unless they can clearly see the connection between them and the, and the asset. Yeah, I think that's right. Do, do you think that the that the producers of Game of Thrones have personas? I mean, I think about like when that, I mean, it clearly it's it's based off of the books, <laughs> right? Uh, and, that, and, and of course, now the last couple a couple seasons like we are way off the reservation so you've got the producers now writing their own stuff but let, let, let's apply this to some real life scenarios i mean like you know how important <laughs> are personas to doing a show like game of thrones and how important is it that producers stick to those personas over time i think that you know the game of thrones producers they obviously know you know their audience what they want to see is drama but they want to see it done well they don't want your your sex in the cities they they want something that's real they want something that's that's bloody and brutal and i think that by understanding that they can really deliver something that the fans will love obviously you know being a tv show it's not something that will appeal to everyone every single time right. but for the most part i think that you know having a clear understanding of who your audience is can ultimately just give positive benefit to it well knowing who your audience is and then also knowing who you're who you're selling to right i mean and in, 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 in hbo's case they're not just selling to you and i who are watching this show <laughs> and who are getting enjoyment out of it you know in many shows they're also selling to advertisers right? right i mean you're trying to reach a certain demographic and so like that's a big part of the persona development is not only knowing you know whether the content's going to hit its mark but also ensuring that you know that you understand and the model for how that content is going to get monetized as well. Right. And I mean, that kind of leads me to start thinking about, you know, trailers and for movies and stuff where let's give an example, uh, a movie called Suicide Squad. That was a DC Comics property. They marketed it as something that would be fun, really lighthearted, really kind of dark humor, but ultimately just a fun romp. But when the audience came into the theater, it turned out to be really, really serious. And it was just marketed completely differently than what people were expecting. And I think that expectation setting at the beginning is, an, is a crucial part of ensuring that you're getting a positive response from your audience. I mean, it was also marketed as a good movie. Right? It was which, also which, is, which, is, which, which also <laughs> seemed to be a part of the bait and switch. Uh, Paul, Paul, did you have a comment on, on our – Here we uh, go. Yeah. I did, and it, uh, it, it mirrors what somebody tweeted in here. We're both thinking the same thing. Thing. Like with the example you just gave, what if the persona turns out to be different than the one you envisioned? You thought it was this person that you were playing to. You thought you knew your customer and everything about them, and it turns out to be somebody totally different is watching this thing. Well, that happens a lot. I mean, that happens in a lot of contexts, right? Where, you know, especially like you build a product that you think is for one audience and all mm -hmm. of a sudden a totally different audience reacts to it. And we were talking earlier about the the need to adjust your personas accordingly. You may take – it may not be a, a small incremental adjustment. It may be a big-ass pivot, right, that you make to try to achieve that. I mean, just back to Game of Thrones just because it's fun. <laughs> I mean, like, so, so it seems like a more difficult thing to do. Like if I'm doing – if I have a show called, like, you know, Quaker Cross Cross Stitching, <laughs> like, that might be a fairly narrow. I topic. would watch that show. Cra well, Quaker go, Cross I mean, Stitching. If, if, it was, <laughs> if it was done in tiny houses, I'm in. I'm totally in. <laughs> Game of Thrones is probably, like, the closest we have today to the old Family Ties and Cosby Show and MASH and the shows that Le I love losing the shows that everybody watches. Must Bill watch Cosby TV. Must watch TV. Right. Bill Cosby with Dragons. I'm not going <laughs> anywhere near that. This is a family show. When you've got something that is kind of of ubiquitous like that do do personas still matter does it matter for you to sort of have a better understanding of who you're attracting when you're when you're attracting such a wide audience i think that when it comes to something as wide as that i think that there are definitely ways to ensure that your personas make sense mm -hmm. the only question is you know how where do you draw the line from one persona to another and i think that that's that's might be an issue that a lot of people, you know, especially for something with that has such a wide offering, 
it's a hard distinction to, to make. Well, and, and let's, let me bring up another example that's, you know, a pop culture example of, you know, multiple personas and in some cases competing interests in those personas. Let's take like, uh, I may be getting my comic book here we go. mixed up here, yeah, <laughs> but let me say, like, like the Avengers, right? Like I, I like the Avengers movies. They are very entertaining. For me, it's just like, take my brain off, put it aside totally. and just watch a really good, just action movie. Some people like are real, they know the backstories, they've mm-hmm. read the comics. And so for me, it's just entertainment for other people. They may be like, oh, they got this detail wrong or they got this detail wrong. So now you've got multiple personas, but you've got almost competing personas. That's a good point. I think that when it comes to different mediums, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a different audience for a different medium. In the case of movies, some people prefer comic books, some people prefer movies. But I think that there's a big issue to be had when people start assuming that one medium is supposed to follow one to one to another medium. It's like in when we're creating content, this white paper isn't going to be the same as this infographic. It's going to have the same kind of basis of content, but they're not going to be one to one. And I think that when you start making those assumptions that as a buyer, when you start making those assumptions, it you're not you're always going to be disappointed. Basically, okay. you're. So the channel mix might end up changing the way that you weight some of that. Like we've yeah. seen that, you know, g- across generational buyers are still spend a lot of time on supplier websites. But just as a preview of this re- this generational research, you know, we see that the the millennials are spending less time on supplier mm-hmm. websites and spending more time with video and social and shorter form content. Yeah, interesting. So uh, this is fascinating. I mean, we could go on for a long time about personas. I know we just got a couple minutes left to go here. We we always ask at the end of the program sort of a question around the Mount Rushmore of sales. If I were to ask you sort of the Mount Rushmore of B2B marketing, the Mount Rushmore of content. Who are some of the people that have influenced you? And if you say it's me, then you're, I'm kicking you out of the studio. Okay, but I guess if, I'm going to leave here. Yeah, to, right. But I, you know, who are the people that you've read? Who are the people that you've paid attention to, you know, as you have grown in your career in marketing so far? Who's had an influence on you? Obviously, it's a cop out to say the people at this job. So I won't say that, but you know can, that that is a given. You can say your manager and your team. I'm sure I know that they're listening and that's that's acceptable. <laughs> Maria, Rebecca, this one's for you, for you guys. <laughs> you know, I also really love just reading about not specifically ways that that B2B marketing can be improved, but just ways that we as writers and as people who are consumers of content can be can be more proactive about how we're creating something. So in all of the blog posts that I write for for Heinz, you know, they're all centered around the human the human aspect of things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, having a wide range of sources, you know, not just limited to B2B or to whatever industry you're in, it helps you get a better understanding and, and a firmer grasp on on what's being said out there today. And so that you're not creating content in a vacuum. Amen to that. I heard you said multiple times over the last 30 minutes to talk about you, you know being human and really make things more relatable. And I think you know, that's the, ultimately the objective and the purpose of a lot of good personas. If you want to learn more about personas, you can certainly check out more information at HeinzMarketing.com. We've got some templates and other information on your content strategy and how to make those more human. If you liked your conversation today, you want to share this content with others on your marketing team, you'll be able to find a replay of this podcast as well as every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio on Sales Pipeline Radio. Dot com. If you like the nature of what we're talking about, we don't get to talk about Game of Thrones every week. <laughs> we absolutely talk about Suicide Squad every week. Every week. <laughs> every single week. Every week. At Replace, least one. get Leto out of here. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. So, yeah, the, <laughs> but uh, if you want to hear if you want to hear more conversations on, with on about sales and marketing, uh, definitely find us on the iTunes store and Google Play. Uh, that's all the time we got for today. Thank you, Josh, for joining us. For my fine producer, Paul, this is Matt Hines. We'll see you next week on Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been listening to Sales Pipeline Radio, brought to you by Matt Hines and Hines Marketing, right here on the Funnel Radio Channel for at-work listeners like you.